expected uh, overnight. Well, so um, yesterday I used the whiteboard, and today um, I wanted to use the slides and do a review, um, and also um, make it more general. So yesterday I just talked about logarithmic utility and uh, uh, you know a special case, but today I want to talk about um, uh, a more general way of uh, solving it with a general utility function. And uh, if Gur is not here, but if, if, he, if he were here, then he would be happy because there is also going to be uh, equitation. And it's nice to, 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 to have you know, a big picture perspective with slides and the detailed perspective with, uh, um, with, uh, with calculations. Okay, but I'm, what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start by uh, rebinding the model and just showing some pictures because it's nice to see some pictures. Okay, so this is basically the model we had yesterday with um, two small changes. Okay, so so remember it's an economy. Uh, there are uh, experts and then there are households. Uh, so the experts they're more productive at using capital than households. They get different output. Uh, they can uh, uh, manage capital, which uh, carries uh, uh, aggregate shocks, um, and they can uh, build new capital through investment. So uh, I'm going to assume for today, yesterday it was logarithmic utility, but for today I'll, I'll show uh, how it works with CRRA utility. And uh, I'm also going to allow for uh, equity uh, issuance. So the assumption is that uh, the experts, when they finance the projects, they can raise money by issuing debt, and they can also pass on a portion of risk to uh, households through equity issuance. So uh, capital can be traded at an endogenous price uh, Q, and this is the same model as yesterday, except uh, uh, allows for equity issuance and allows for uh, CRRA utility. And I'm going to talk about this model today, and if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, money, and that's probably going to be nice, a nice introduction for Guru's lectures, because he's going to talk about um, Bitcoin. So, so you'll be well prepared, and you can ask him tough questions. <laughs> okay, so first, uh, let, me, let me show an example. So um, yesterday, I talked about this model without uh, equity issuance. This is how it works with uh, equity issuance. So this is the first example is logarithmic utility. And uh, these are numerically plotted uh, uh, diagrams. So uh, as a function of uh, uh, experts' wealth share, uh, the price of capital is a function of it. Uh, and for in the slow range, the price of capital drops because uh, the experts, they have to delever. They have to, well, they choose to delever. Uh, they have some choice about how to do it, but they sell capital to households, and households are less productive. And because the, ho the less productive agents hold capital, the price drops. Um, and uh, something interesting here is, is that, um, which is new, is, uh, so of course, the, for most of the range, well, for, it looks like for half of the range, but uh, uh, now that experts are able to offload some risk to households through equity issuance, um, they will basically do it to the maximum, okay? Except uh, when uh, experts' wealth is, is so large that uh, so if experts' wealth, for example, is uh, 0.8, then uh, uh, they're going to hold all of the capital, but they're going to uh, issue only some of the risks so that risk sharing is perfect. So basically, there is, a, there is an unconstrained region where risk sharing is, uh, is perfect. Uh, but this region where risk sharing is perfect is um, um, not really important because the system is never going to enter. It. So if the system starts there, then uh, uh, experts and households, they earn equal risk premium, so it's going to drift back into uh, 
the region where the action is happening, uh, and uh, it's never going to re-enter. So this is because of the assumption that, uh, uh, so remember that the drift of uh, the state variable, the wealth share, is determined by the, uh, the excess returns that uh, the two groups earn, which are the same in this region. But here, experts, they bear more risk, so they earn more. Uh, and also the consumption rates. So the, um, uh, the assumption here is that experts are less patient, so it drifts back here. Yeah. So my, my apologies, I, I missed your first lecture. The, the financial friction here is the fact that there's a limit on, on equity that, that the experts can issue. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 this, and this comes from a moral hazard constraint of some kind? So you can tell like a moral hazard story, skin in the game constraint that the experts think. But in the model itself, the moral hazard's not modeled. It's not modeled, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it can be motivated by moral hazard, but it's, um, um, you know, for simplicity, it's made to be uh, just a cookie cutter, cookie cutter constraint. So it's meant to capture something that, that would come out of a more micro-founded model in a, in a simple way. Okay. Um, so, so all of the action happens here. Um, this is the crisis region where uh, sales of capital happen. And we see that because uh, the price of capital is, is sensitive to the state variable, here the volatility, this is endogenous risk endogenous risk is, uh, is going to, to rise, okay? Um, and uh, so this is the drift of eta. Here it's uh, positive. When, when the volatility spikes up, it is going to rise. Uh, so the system is going to live around this point and occasionally enter the crisis region where, uh, where there is endogenous risk. And, and also because because the risk suddenly rises here, uh, there is a big chance that the system is, is going to, to get uh, even lower. So there's going to be a big fat tail in the distribution and maybe even a bimodal distribution depending Can on you, parameters. Yeah, so the asymptotic dynamics near zero is like a geometric Brownian motion. So the state variable eta behaves like a geometric Brownian motion. And you can characterize the, uh, the relative drift and, and volatility. And if, if you analyze this process, which um, you know, behaves near zero as a geometric Brownian motion, then uh, you can get uh, different cases. So zero will actually never be hit, okay? But uh, one question you can ask is, well, what the stationary distribution looks like? How, how the stationary distribution looks like. And so it could be that the stationary distribution goes to zero at zero. It could be that the stationary distribution goes to infinity at zero. Or it could even be that the the stationary distribution goes to infinity, but it also integrates to infinity, okay? Uh, and in the last case, it would mean that in the long run, the system, yeah, then you do not have a proper stationary distribution. So then the system in the long run uh, gets closer and closer to, to zero. Um, and I think the last, uh, the last possibility cannot happen here, but uh, it could be one of the other two, depending on parameters. Yes. So you're talking about in uh, you're talking about a math question or financial frictions. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Um, 
formal answer is uh, you can take the Kolmogorov forward equation and then plug in a geometric Brownian motion process. Um, and then the solution is a power function, uh, which power depends on uh, the uh, ratio of drift and volatility. And from that, you can tell which case it falls into. So, so if any of you ever book. has this, ah? Carlin's book, okay, yes, yes, okay, so that's, um, okay. So let me show some other examples. So, so next I'll show some comparative statics. And by the way, this is already with uh, CRRA utility. Uh, so the first comparative static is on uh, the level of uh, uh, exogenous risk. Uh, and here, one interesting thing is, well, so uh, first I'm going to start with, with something which is, which is intuitive. The, so intuitive is that when uh, exogenous risk goes down, then the size of the crisis region becomes smaller. Okay. Uh, but, and intermediaries, they need less capital. So the amount of capital that the intermediaries have at the steady state uh, also gets less. So the, the fact that the crisis region gets smaller does not necessarily imply that crises are less likely because in response to less risk, these people, they take on more leverage and so that they end up closer to, uh, to the crisis regime, which is smaller. Um, but uh, so that's okay. So, so that's something one, one would expect, but something that's interesting that happening in this specific example is that the level of endogenous risk actually rises uh, when uh, uh, exogenous risk gets smaller. So, so basically, the shocks get smaller, but, they're, but these people take on more leverage. And because these people take on more leverage, when crisis starts, there's a lot more amplification. So, so you know, whether this happens or not depends on, huh? Like with seat belts, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a, that's a good analogy, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so yesterday I talked about the result, what happens in, in the limit as sigma goes to zero, and uh, uh, I showed you a proof that, well, I hand waved <laughs> about the proof. But you can, you can uh, that the um, as as sigma goes to zero, the crisis uh, region does not disappear. So at sigma equal to zero, there is a discontinuity because at sigma zero equal to zero, there is no risk that can be uh, amplified. Okay, um, and uh, so. This is the amount of equity issuance which is allowed, okay? And uh, one could guess that when uh, uh, experts, they can pass on more risk to, to households, risk sharing is better, so it, things get more stable. But it's, but it's, but it's the same effect as with, uh, with sigma that uh, when, when the experts, they can, they can pass on risk to households, then their risk exposure is lower, so, uh, so they're able to lever up even more, okay? And basically, this is, this is the same effect. And, and actually, um, so you could imagine that if, uh, if this is not a fixed parameter, but the, it somehow changes, so in crisis, it's harder to uh, to do risk sharing, then there, there could be additional amplification from that. Okay, but you can see that when more, when you can have more equity issues, then endogenous risk goes up. So this is interesting. So this is the next slide, and this is um, comparative static on the household's productivity. Okay, um, and. Uh, this difference between uh, A and A underlined, you could, say, you could call it, this is the, um, 
this is the illiquidity of capital. So if you sell it from uh, the natural buyers and uh, you have to do fire sales to somebody else who's, who's willing to pick up, if, uh, if their value from capital is much lower, then the price could potentially drop much more. Okay. And uh, basically, you know, here's, here's what we see, uh, what can happen. So he, this is for a lower A, this is for a, for a higher A, sorry, A underlined, right? A underlined. So this, how much the price can drop in, in crisis. And when the price can drop uh, um, more, then there is a lot more amplification. So of course the you know the, the size of Q is the price of capital. So when it goes from A, A underlined, what is moving here? So A underlined is moving. So there are three A different line. values for A underlined. This is so oh, that's getting worse. This is how bad are the households at uh, at managing capital. They're you know they're. Uh, they're yeah, they're worse and worse and worse. Exactly, they're losing, they're losing money on, uh, on managing capital. Exactly, so they have a holding cost from, from managing capital. This, the, the technology is, this is, this is negative, but they can disinvest, they can convert capital to output, they can eat the capital. At, at, you know, there's some curvature, right? But, uh, so, uh, for example, in Hin Krishnamuti, uh, there are specialists who can uh, uh, hold risky assets, and the households, they cannot hold risky assets. So that case corresponds to A underlined equal to minus infinity. Not, not to A underlined equal to zero. <laughs> because equal to zero, they can, they can, still, they can still do pretty well uh, in this model. Uh, and so this is with different uh, risk aversion coefficients. Um, and it looks like, so it looks like the amplification is biggest with the lowest risk aversion of uh, experts, and uh, and I guess you could you could give the intuition that well, when they're least risk averse, then they're going to lever up more, so there's going to be more amplification. So that's sort of uh, that makes sense at least. Okay, so this is just to give a flavor of how the model works, and now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, review some of the methodology and expand on it. Okay, so this is a macro model, and um, there is some forward dynamics. So we go from the past to the present. Okay, uh, so so in this model, the state variable is the wealth distribution, but you know you can write more interesting models than than this model. You know, because you know you are young and bright, uh, and uh, using you know, you know what what you think is interesting to to put in besides um, besides this variable. So you can, but but it, it in generally there you're going to have some forward equations that describe how the system evolves. Okay, and uh, when you put yourselves at the present time in the shoes of you know, individual people and your model that make decisions, then they're going to look into the future and form some expectations. So here, these expectations, they'll be captured by value functions and prices. Okay. And then based on those expectations, uh, there is going to be uh, an allocation which is determined at the, at the current time. So I'm going to talk about the allocation equations. And uh, something else that's also determined at, at the current time is endogenous risk. Okay. So it's useful to conceptually separate those, those two. So even both are determined in the present time. So I'll explain you know, why those are useful to separate uh, conceptually. Okay. So 
first uh, the law of motion of wealth shares and I'm going to uh, review the most efficient method uh, and also generalize it uh, a little bit. Okay, so this is going to be quick. So the key equation is uh, the valuation equation that if you compare the returns of two different risky assets, then uh, the difference in the returns is explained by the difference in, uh, in risk. Uh, and I did this wrong because I did this for the log, log utility. This should be the, um, uh, the volatility of the stochastic discount factor or the marginal utility minus with the minus sign. Okay, so something that they have discovered after working in it for a few years suddenly that magically you can, you can get uh, the, the answer by a change of new mirror, but you have to do it right, is you can get the law of motion of wealth shares by choosing the right numerator and by choosing the right assets. Okay? And the numerator here is going to be the total wealth in the economy. So when an asset is going to be the whole portfolio of uh, any agent and uh, some other asset which everybody can trade, like the risk-free asset. Okay. And, and here, in, in this numerator, the return on uh, the whole portfolio is just the drift of the wealth share plus the consumption rate. Okay. So, so why, why this is the case is because, well, you know, you, you're measuring wealth relative to the total, so how much of it is, is it? It's just the, the wealth share. So it gives you directly the, the law of motion of the wealth share, what, what you want to get when using that numerator. Uh, and so this is the, the left-hand side. This is the uh, return in the risk-free asset. And it's with a hat because in this numerator, it's not going to be risk-free. So <laughs> it's easy to make a mistake here. Uh, and on the right side, okay, so this is the, this is the difference in uh, risk of the wealth and um, the risk-free asset. And if you do the algebra, then uh, the, the difference does not depend on numerator, okay, because the same adjustment will, will, will affect both, both of the risks and they cancel out. So the individual risks, they depend on the numerator. You know, some asset could be risky in one numerator, but risk-free in another numerator. Okay, so this is just the... It's because the numerator is not actually denominated in both cases. Exactly, exactly. You, you have this amazing ability to, to do it in your head in the spot. Okay, and... and uh, and this is the, um, so this is the, the cost of risk, uh, the uh, volatility of the stochastic, the, the, uh, the minus the volatility of the marginal utility of consumption in that, in that numerator. Okay, so base, you basically have that. And uh, uh, so you can have as many agent types as you want. Okay. And how do you get the, the wealth shares is that, well, you have, uh, if you have uh, 10 agents, then you have 10 equations like this. Okay. Uh, and these are your unknowns, and there are nine of them because they add up to, to zero, the drifts of wealth shares, uh, and plus one. So you have as many equations as unknowns. Okay, and with, with two agents, you do it for experts, you do it for households, and then uh, you use this um, condition that it all adds up to, to the constant wealth share of one. Uh, and is then... The no, this is, this is, this is still... This, this, yeah, is, this, is, this, is, this is general, exactly, this is general. Mm -hmm. And then you have... Um, Uh, 
and then you have this uh, this equation. So, so that's 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 how you get it, and uh, um, and it's nice because you know you sort of have to think to make sure that you measure things right in the in the in this numerator, but then you get to the answer very quickly. Okay. So this is the this is the the past. Now let me talk about uh, the the present, which has two uh, components. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, so here are the the balance sheets of uh, uh, agents. So experts they have um, some capital. They borrow some debt against this capital, and they can they can uh, have uh, uh, inside equity and outside equity. So inside equity is their wealth, and outside equity is so the households they can buy this outside equity, and then they can hold this debt of experts. So uh, this is in zero net supply, the risk-free asset, and they they can hold some capital, and then they have some some wealth, and. Uh, uh, Something that's not in the picture is the households could also issue equity to experts against against their capital, but but I didn't include it in the picture because um, the experts' risk premium they are higher than those of households, so you know right away that that's not going to happen. But you could you could include it. Okay. So um, how do you determine the this allocation? Okay. And. Uh, uh, here's something that's 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 really really cool. That's very very general. You know, applies to this model to to many uh, other models. That um, that basically the solution to this um, allocation problem, you allocate assets, you allocate um, shares of uh, firms, you you can make production decisions, uh, and ultimately it all has to solve uh, one maximization problem. So you can basically uh, get the allocation out of a single maximization problem. So the, basically, it's Marcus and I we call it a price taking planner. Okay. So given asset risk, given risk premium. Uh, the allocation solves the price-taking central planner problem, which is basically to allocate assets and to choose production decisions to maximize the total return minus the average cost of risk. So this is basically corporate finance 101, right? You maximize firm value minus the weighted average cost of capital, okay? And you choose uh, how to uh, how to uh, how to finance the firm. So you choose equity issuance to to minimize the cost of capital, okay? And then within the firm, you make decisions to, to maximize return, okay? And then the, uh, in this specific model, this is, this is going to be the maximization problem. So you maximize the return from all of the capital that's invested partially held by households and partially, sorry, partially held by experts and partially held by households. So this is a dividend yield and the whole world capital. This is one, one big firm that, that's basically allocating the productive assets to different agents. This is the capital gains rate. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the cost of, the cost of, uh, the cost of capital, right? So part of, it, part of the risk goes to uh, experts and part of the risk goes to, to households. And basically, the intuition is uh, uh, Fisher separation theorem. So, given the cost of capital, production decisions um, should max that maximize firm value. I do not know what I wrote. Okay. Uh, given the cost of capital, production decisions should maximize yeah. firm value to a superfluous. superfluous. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Given the cost of capital, exactly. So, so, that, so, given the cost of capital, that is uh, that is 
key here. So, so people take as given the, the, co these, the cost of capital, people take a, as given how the price of capital is going to evolve in the, in the next moment. Okay. Um, but if there are different goods, then the prices of goods, they... Um, they're determined through this maximization problem. And, and you can see that in here, there is, a, there is a decision of how to allocate capital. There is a decision of how much to invest. There is the decision of capital structure. So, you know, so it can be done more generally. So, so this is neat that, uh, and why this is, why, why this is nice? It, it's nice because if you write a more complicated model, you're gonna have many, many conditions. And it's nice to have, you know, one maximization problem that it just, okay, that it just doesn't. Um, and also, one thing that's nice here is, is intuition. So this is, this has very much a flavor of optimality, okay? Except that the price is optimized. Exactly, exactly. Except that these joint decisions, they're going to affect how the wealth distribution is going to evolve, and, that, and that's going to affect uh, endogenous risk, uh, and, and, uh, and so there's going to be this extra loop which, which can make the equilibrium uh, inefficient. Yes? Yeah, so this is, a, this is at a given moment in time. So this is a static maximization problem. You're going you're gonna to have a different Xi. So Xi is going to be different for different moments in time. So at each moment in time, you make a decision for this moment in time, what is optimal at this moment in time, taking into account all of the sufficient statistics that summarize the future, you know, the value functions and the risk premium, so on and so forth. So, is it given for price? Well, if I maximize the price for some plus 2 plus 5, I get the difference for some price. If I maximize the price, I'm here, then I get a different price. Yeah. But how do I make sure, how do I know for sure that for this style, I will be able to get to this style with 2 plus 5? I mean, potentially, it could be some kind of yeah, so it's um, uh, like you're asking a question that uh, Bellman, you know, asked, uh, you know, uh, 60, 70 years ago, right? That, uh, that if you have, you know, this, you know, multi-period decision problem, and, and his insight was that, okay, you know, you you summarize the future through the value function and then and then th that allows you to just focus on today's decision okay uh, and uh, and you don't worry about the future because if you worry about the future you're going to go crazy <laughs> exactly so 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 a part of it is you know you'll have to deal with the future. So there's going to be another step to deal with the future. But, but right now, you know, you're sitting, you're, you know, I go crazy if I think about it all at once. I have trouble thinking about it all at once. And that's why I find it useful to, to break it down, you know, into these four blocks. So in, e in equilibrium, you have a value function for each type of agent, okay? And then, uh, uh, and then you know, their risk premium has so to this, this come from... This one? This one. Mm -hmm. 
static problem. This one is a static problem, yeah. And now, static problem where you have to enter uh, the, I don't even know what the symbols are, the X looking thing? Yeah, you, <laughs> you, the enter, you, enter, you enter these yeah. ones, and then, and then, so you choose these ones. Yeah, you choose these ones. Those and you. Uh -huh. comes from your right? The Xi comes from um, uh, so this is wait, which is oh this is right, 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 right okay, yeah. yeah. Come they come from the equilibrium problem, yeah. So what you're telling us is if you take this side from the equilibrium problem and also the two that come from the equilibrium problem. Mm -hmm. And if those are from the equilibrium problem, then you do the optimization thing. You choose exactly the shares of the equilibrium problem. The shares that prevail in the equilibrium problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. What, that's what the third step is. Mm -hmm. There's no question you really understand. So you're going to be, if you solve this static problem, you take into account the key that explains the function of the equilibrium, the value of the function of the equilibrium problem, then you get the right size. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, ultimately, it's, you know, different agents making their own individual production decisions and uh, how much capital to buy. So the experts, they choose how much capital to buy and uh, uh, how, how to uh, finance it. Uh, and uh, maybe in another model, they could choose which good to produce from capital and they choose how much to invest. Okay. Uh, so all of those, all of those decisions, you know, you could keep scratching your head uh, which equations, you know, you actually have to write to, to solve it. So this is saying that um, you, can, you can write one maximization problem. So endogenous risk, okay, so that's another component of uh, what happens at the given moment in time. So in this static problem, the volatilities are taken as given, okay? But uh, the volatilities, uh, they're determined through, um, they, they're going to follow from these decisions, okay? And uh, they're going to be created by, by a feedback effect. Uh, so the price of capital is sensitive to wealth distribution. So if a shock, uh, hits, then uh, the shock is going to have a certain uh, primary effect on the wealth share of experts, okay? And uh, how big it is depends on the leverage of, of experts. So this, e this is going to equal to zero if the experts are not levered. Otherwise, this is, this is how much capital they, how much risk they hold relative to their wealth share. So if um, uh, the expert's wealth share drops, then capital demand drops. So then the price of capital is going to react. So this is how the price of capital using Ito's formula, well, yeah, is going to react to a particular shock. And then this change in the price is going to feed into the expert's wealth share. And basically, if you go through this loop, then you have a, a geometric series, okay? Uh, and adding up, you get the formula for uh, endogenous risk. Okay, and we had a, a version of this formula yesterday. So this is the creation of endogenous risk. Okay, so we've talked about the law of motion of st the state variable. We've talked about the price taking central planner how endogenous risk is created from those decisions which take risk as given. So they don't take into account that, that it's created. And, and now um, uh, about uh, value functions, right? So this slide summarizes how to deal with CRRA utility. So you have... Uh, 
So we can introduce value functions of, of experts and uh, And this is the utility of a representative expert. Okay. And this is the utility of a representative household. Okay. Uh, and the reason it's written in, in this way is because uh, with TRRA utility, there's going to be a scaling factor. So if you scale up the economy, it's going to uh, affect the utility by exactly this, this factor. And plus V is going to a function of this, be a function of the state variable. Okay. So V is some function. So so right now, we ask the following question. So suppose we have a function v, and we have a function v underlined for households at the given moment in time. Okay. So then, how do we use those functions to determine uh, the current allocation? And how do we use those functions to iterate backwards to determine the value functions a moment earlier? So. Um, okay, and uh, so the so we use those functions to get everything which will be useful for us out of those fu functions, and then we put them into the equations for the current moment in time. Uh, we solve them, and then we go backwards to get the value functions a moment earlier. Okay. So one interesting fact about uh, TRRA utility is that if you uh, take the first order condition with respect to consumption, then you can derive uh, a relationship between consumption, the value function, and, uh, and wealth. And if you plug it back into the uh, value function, then you're going to get an expression like this, okay, which is which is a which is really cool. But basically, what it says is that for TRA utility, if you know somebody's consumption and if you know their wealth, then you know their entire uh, utility, uh, regardless of what the future may look like. So those are uh, sufficient uh, summary statistics. And the, the utility is going to be in this form. It's going to be wealth times uh, consumption to the power minus gamma divided by minus gamma. Okay. And uh, uh, for, for the, you know, in the interest in time, I'm, I'm not going to, to derive it. But if you're very interested and uh, you don't know how to do it, you can ask me uh, later. Okay. So, so if I take this expression and wealth of the total wealth of experts is the wealth share times the total wealth. So if I, if I plug it in, then I can, ex I can express. So, so basically, you see that this is just you know, multiplying both sides and dividing both sides by the same factor. You express C minus gamma in terms of K minus gamma and other variables which are here. Okay? And this is the marginal utility of consumption. And it will be useful because uh, this is going to lead to the uh, price of risk. Okay. If I rearrange it a little bit differently, I can get a ratio of consumption to capital. Okay. So I get a, a ratio of consumption to capital. Okay. And if I if I divide both sides by e to times q then I'm going to get the ratio of consumption to wealth, and I'm going to get an expression for consumption to wealth. So this is just algebra. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so these will be useful. Okay. So the, I'm going to start with the ratio of consumption to capital. This will be useful for the uh, market clearing condition for, for output at the given moment in time, because this is the total output and this is the, the demand. Okay. And uh, uh, this will be useful for the law of motion of the state variable, because, because it has um, uh, those ratios for experts and households. 
And this will be useful because if I uh, take the volatility, and so this is going to be the volatility of V minus the volatility of eta minus the volatility of Q and minus uh, gamma sigma, then I'm going to get the, the price of risk. Okay? Um, and, uh, and those of you who are really paying attention, at this point, you can notice that uh, there is a mistake in my slide. <laughs> But but so uh, so let me see if somebody if somebody can can point out the mistake. So there is there is this expression. Look at this expression, and look at uh, look at this expression. And where is the mistake? Anybody knows or wants to make a guess? So, so the mistake is this, is this is using output as numerator, and this is using total wealth as numerator, right? So, so I have to make an adjustment. I guess I, I have to subtract. Um, um, I have to subtract the volatility of total wealth, which is sigma q plus sigma. So this this. You know, so I forgot to make this adjustment. So, so this this just alerts you that you know that you have to be careful. <laughs> Although you're probably better than me <laughs> when it comes to doing doing calculations, but uh, you know, still. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, so so all right. So so then you know this is what goes directly into determining the the current uh, well the current moment. These these are these go into determining the current moment allocation. Okay, and then once you have the current moment allocation, then you can plug it into uh, value function equations to determine value functions a moment earlier. Okay, and the value function equation is like the HGB equation, except that in the HGB equation you have maximization, but here some of the uh, some of the things are going to come from equilibrium rather than to be chosen by the agent, and so you put them from remotely computed for the, for the equilibrium. Okay. But, uh, but the, the good news is that if you have um, uh, an HGB equation solver, okay, that basically allows you to uh, take a policy and given the policy find the, the value function a moment earlier, you can just use that, uh, that um, HGB equation solver to solve uh, this equation except you're, you're doing it twice, once for uh, experts and another for, for households, okay? So basically, if you have a, uh, if, you're, if, if you know how to solve the types of equations that uh, Jose is, is solving, um, then, you know, you can, you can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, right. Um, Yes, but but you know, so so I actually have you know I actually wrote a wrote my own solver for 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 solving these and uh, uh, and you know I noticed that this type of an equation is a you know pretty standard equation that comes up in you know various models with growth. Okay, so basically to solve it, you put in uh, a grid over the state variable. Okay, and uh, you. Uh, put in a payoff, okay, which is which is which is that, the current period payoff. You put in the drift and the volatility of the uh, state variable at each point on the on the grid, okay, and then because it's scaled by capital, you also put the drift and the volatility of capital, which are you know fairly easy. The drift is just investment rate minus depreciation, and the volatility is the is the volatility, okay. And then you, you solve it backwards over you know a short uh, interval of time. You put in the value functions you know uh, a moment later, and then you keep you keep using it. Um, and uh, when somebody writes the same, so I wrote this function for one dimension, uh, and when somebody writes it, maybe one of you for uh, uh, two and more dimensions, then all kinds of macro models can be solved. 
because because uh, because you don't have to worry about solving it. You can just let the computer do it. Uh, so then then life will be great. Okay. Uh, and and how 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 this can be solved is um, choose some terminal condition. So something you know something defined you know, what happens to the economy a billion years from, from today, you know, something not too crazy, okay, and then, and then solve for it backwards, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yesterday, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so um, if, so here you have, you know, a, a fixed grid, right? Um, and uh, relative to the, the each grid point, the process could go, you know, right one step or, or left one step, right? Uh, in discrete time, you, you, ha you, you have it and then where it jumps from in uh, in in one period, in, it can be anywhere. It can be you know in between. Could be a whole distribution, and on top of it, it's endogenous. Uh, so it could be it could be determined by 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 a fixed point. So, yeah, that's why I like to do things in continuous. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, like the comparison principle, right? Is there a discrete time comparison principle? Ah, so you can use the comparison comparison principle that Jose taught yesterday is really powerful and really awesome, uh, and uh, nobody in economics is using it. So if you start using it, you know you. Um, then, then you're ahead of everybody. Oh no! Uh, well, um, absolutely. I mean, to to be honest, when I started working with Marcus, we wrote uh, our first model in discrete time, uh, and uh, and that's that's very very helpful for, um, you know, sort of like understanding the timing, you know, at a, at a, you know, at, at a, at a small level. So, you know, that's, that's, that's extremely useful. So it, it's complementary and, uh, uh, and there is a lot of, you know, uh, discrete time literature that, you know, that, you know, does great things, but, at, but at some point in discrete time, you know they did amazing things, but uh, but sometimes you know to to take the next step, like uh, it helps to add continuous time to make it more tractable. Yeah. Yeah, mm hmm yeah.
I mean, in, in this case, you know, we actually started from uh, so, so from a discrete discrete time model. So, right. so I guess one question is, you know, have we like done it formally? Have you written a paper proving that this model is a, is a limit oh, okay. of uh, this discrete time models? Is uh, 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 I mean, so, um, How many brown emotions we have here? Uh, one. Well, in this, in this, in this specific model one, in this specific model one. Do we know of a single example when a continuous time paper was written and at some point later it was busted because somebody proved it that, uh, that, uh, that it's not a proper limit of discrete time? I mean, there, there, the, yeah. So, so, so one of one of the examples that you know that sort of like I have personally seen is that uh, you know people sometimes think intuitively, okay, you know, this continuous time model corresponds to this specific discrete time model. You know, they use an you know, intuitive argument why that's why that's why that's the case, and this intuition you have to be careful with because that like the example, those examples are, uh, exist. So, so then it, it means that, well, you know, that this continuous time model does not correspond to that discrete time model, but this corresponds to this discrete time model. And this discrete time model, if you did it in continuous time, you have to do it, you know, that way. So, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess after you work with continuous time models a little bit, then you get a, a good sense for what is the right type of a, Correspondence here, I would say. Yeah, if, if you're not careful, you can, you can screw up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So this is this is the the last question that I'm taking before before I move on. Uh, you can ask me later, but I'm, after this question, I'm going to move on. So okay. So so yes. So uh, you know, people talk about th this is actually a very important question. Qu uh, people talk about the fact that well, you know, this continuous time model is you know normal at least on a on a small time scale, and people talk about the limitations uh, of that. Uh, and uh, so people sometimes add Poisson jumps to to a Brownian model, um, which is uh, slightly clunkier than than Brownian, but uh, less clunkier than discrete time models, I would say. Uh, and but but then if if one talks about you know fat tails. Then, uh, uh, even though here the, sh the fundamental shocks that are fed into this model are normal, the uh, equilibrium actually does generate fat tails because why? Because here, 
the, the way that the shocks are amplified uh, after uh, a bad realization of shocks, then, then amplification becomes much bigger. So then the distribution actually has fat tails here endogenously from the shocks which, uh, which do, not, do not have fat tails. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so, so these are solved backwards, and, uh, um, and I think that, uh, so, um, and basically I think that this is it, right? Um, I still have 25 minutes to talk about something else. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about something else for, uh, for 25 But let me finish by, by saying that, you know, if, if you find it interesting and if you want to learn more, um, I work on this jointly with Marcus Brunemeyer, who is a former colleague at Princeton, and we have some, uh, you know, resources that you can look up. So this survey, uh, you know, if uh, you find it, we attempted to um, explain certain things as, as pedagogically as we can. Um, and since we wrote it, we actually found some more efficient ways of, of doing things, so maybe you're going to write something else. Uh, and then we are doing the Princeton Initiative, where uh, you can look at uh, basically past lectures and the past problem sets uh, related to this. Um, uh, and uh, Marcus is very entrepreneurial. So in the spring, he did this online course uh, across eight universities, uh, financial and monetary economics. And uh, the lecture videos are online, and they're also problem sets. Um, and uh, he is also planning to repeat it uh, in the fall. Uh, it's also going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a part of a Princeton uh, course for graduate students, but it's also going to be you know, uh, online, live, in real time, on Zoom. So, uh, so you, if you're interested, you should you should work out for that. How many of you have you have used Zoom? Yeah. So Zoom Zoom is awesome. Yeah. Look, could you say a word about policy, given the amplification, what government should be doing? Uh, um. Yeah, no, I, so, um, he, here's what I'm, I'm tempted to say. So, uh, so I, I wanted to talk ab about another paper in which we, we did much more serious work on policy. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, you know, I have, I have only 20 minutes left, but I'll do my best. Okay, but I think, I think it's going to be nice to, to see like a flavor of something, something different. But I would love to talk to to talk to you about it later. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to, to avoid the question, but I'm just trying to figure out the most efficient way to, to answer it. Okay. So, um, so, so here's another paper with, with frictions, you know, to give you a flavor of something, something else that you can do. Uh, and uh, um, so, so Marcus and I, we have the I theory of money, which is in between uh, what I talked about before and, and this paper. And, but this paper, it's, it's also about monetary theory, but it's uh, uh, is going a little bit further. And I thought that this is nice to talk about because um, Gur is going to talk about uh, Bitcoin, okay? And you know, thinking about cryptocurrencies, that's a form of money, what determines the value of money. So maybe that's going to be like a nice, uh, a nice link. So here, I guess, policy is, uh, is monetary policy. So how many of you know Bewley economies? OK. So some of you, not, not all of you. So in the Bewley economy, it's a, it's a very nice uh, model in discrete time. And basically, what happens is that people, they have idiosyncratic income shocks. And uh, uh, because of that, something that's uh, intrinsically worthless can have value in equilibrium and serve as money. Uh, so after positive shocks, people can accumulate currency, money, and, and they can spend it uh, after negative shocks. Okay. 
Uh, and in this model, uh, it's going to be like a, like a Boolean model, but it's going to be in continuous time. And uh, uh, idiosyncratic shocks it will be attached to productive capital rather than to, to human capital. And the fact that the capital is tradable uh, makes it more, more tractable. Um, but this model is going to be international, so it's going to be, uh, I mean, here we are trying to think about two currencies, two types of money coexisting. Okay. And, uh, and in this specific model, uh, so there's going to be an international currency, which is given exogenously. And then the, the country can also use their own chips versus an international uh, currency. Okay. So, uh, so the model is, it's a small country, and people in the small country can um, use capital for production. Okay. And uh, this is an investment technology like the one you've seen. And they can sell capital abroad, and they can buy capital from, from abroad. And there is, a, there is a sales price, which is low, and there is a purchase price, which is, which is high. Okay. So uh, I mean, this assumption partially is made for numerical reasons, so that we have a bounded state space. But uh, partially, uh, this, this parameter allows for borrowing international debt and, and basically creates a natural borrowing limit. So the shocks uh, are output shocks. Okay? So instead of putting them on capital, we, we put them uh, on output here. And this is probably a more uh, natural way to, to do it. Okay? Um, and for simplicity, the output is going to be uh, dollars. Okay? So capital is producing dollars. Uh, and dollar is the international currency, with, which has some exogenously given risk free rate R. So we could you know, introduce the, the, the risk here, but um, it's useful to have a numerator which is risk free. OK. And people, uh, the, uh, people can use dollars to save, or they can use the local currency. So the total dollar savings in a the, in the small country equal to the uh, interest rate on the dollar minus consumption plus the output. Um, and then you can sell capital abroad to get dollars, and you can spend the dollars to, to buy capital from abroad. So the frictions here are that these uh, idiosyncratic shocks, they're specific to individual, and they are uninsurable. Uh, and uh, then there are the countrywide shocks, which, uh, uh, so we have a version where they can be insured, but for simplicity, let's say that they're uh, uh, uninsurable, but you can, but if you want to hedge them, you can basically save dollars. Okay. And there is a friction to trading capital internationally. So people have CRRA utility. Uh, and uh, they can uh, save in dollars with risk-free return R. They can save in capital with the type of a return that uh, you know, we've seen in other models. And what's different here is that there are also you know, chips, you know, pesos, that uh, can have value in a small country. And people can, can save chips against the idiosyncratic risk as well as the dollar. And then the in the baseline version, the number of chips is fixed. But uh, uh, then we can talk about monetary policy. And the monetary authority can uh, you know, back chips by taxes uh, and uh, um, you know, basically do monetary policy, set the interest rate. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Why would you use a local currency instead of the dollar? From, and, and you can look at this question from an individual maximization point of view, and you can look at this question from the policymaker so point policy of view. Can't do with policy with Yeah, I mean the. Yeah. 
right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, so individuals they rebalance. Okay, when they get a bad uh, cash flow shock, then uh, uh, they're going to sell some some capital and buy some currency. Okay, and which currency to buy? Well, uh, we don't know. <laughs> Depends in equilibrium. And then the whole country has to adjust to uh, aggregate shocks, except when there is a bad aggregate shock, then uh, they cannot sell capital abroad uh, because there is the spread, unless, unless they're all the way you know, at the push to, to the bottom, then they can adjust by selling. So they try to adjust gradually by adjusting consumption, and then when push comes to shove, then they sell capital abroad. Okay. So, all right, so let me talk about, uh, very briefly, about how this model works with um, uh, just idiosyncratic risk uh, and uh, just with the dollar first and then also with the local currency. So this, this is going to answer Eric's question about why local currency. Okay. So as a function of idiosyncratic risk, so these are just going to be you know, graphs. Um, uh, I'm not going to sh show how to, I probably do not have time to show how to solve the model. Maybe, maybe I can say a couple of words. So if there is very low idiosyncratic risk, and this is a growing small open economy, so they want to borrow the dollars to, to fuel growth, so they're going to borrow the dollars and uh, invest in the uh, local uh, production which has high returns. But as idiosyncratic risk goes up, then the demand for some, something as a store of value goes up, so they start borrowing less, and eventually they, they hold the dollars. Okay? Um, and the uh, interesting thing that happens in this equilibrium is the, the growth that uh, when idiosyncratic risk goes up, then they self-insure by building more capital, even though capital is risky. Okay? And at some point, so then the growth rate goes up with uh, idiosyncratic risk. And at some point, when they start holding the dollars, then instead of investing in, cap in local capital, they invest to build the, the buffer of dollars, and then the growth rate after, after that point goes down. Okay? And uh, so when the growth rate is in the local economy is higher than the return on the dollar, uh, then there is room for a bubble. Because uh, if there is a bubble, which is stationary, which grows at the same rate as the local economy, then it would have a, a higher return than, than a dollar. Okay. So, so in that case, there's, there's also going to be um, an equilibrium where the local currency can have value. Okay. So, so we call this region bubble prone. Okay. So, so this, is, this, actually, this is the region which is, which is bubble prone. And then uh, with the bubble, the growth has to equal to the risk-free rate in the economy, and the risk-free rate is going to be the return in the local currency, uh, which is, uh, has a higher return than the dollar. Okay. And what is interesting here is that um, the, the local currency exists for a range of idiosyncratic risk. Okay. So it, idiosyncratic risk has to be sufficiently large to generate this demand for money, but if, if idiosyncratic risk is too large, then you rush to the dollar. Then, um, an interesting uh, thought experiment here is that suppose that you are here uh, and there is an unexpected shock to idiosyncratic risk and you jump here, then that's really bad. Because, because huh? the, current, the local currency becomes worthless. become worthless, exactly. And, uh, and then they all jump to the dollar. Okay. But, but this, is the, this is the steady state level of, of the dollars, the equilibrium. So, so they start by not having the dollars because they were using the local currency. And so they are going to spend everything that they produce to export when, when, they're, when they're really in trouble and when they're really poor, they're going to send all of their output out of the country uh, to get the dollars. So, that's, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a sudden stop. That's what's going to happen. Okay. Um, and um, so, 
Okay, so so polish your space. So in this paper, we do um, you know two things. We we define one policy space, which is like well defined mathematically, and it's it's a complete policy space that the policymaker can uh, basically control the local portfolio shares on the dollar and the local currency. So this involves capital controls. Okay, and then we can look at, and besides that, we also look at some specific policies which are weaker that without capital controls, just uh, backing local uh, currency uh, fiscally. Okay, so. Um, I do not have a whole lot of time, so I might uh, skip over something. So one of the things that is interesting is um, uh, equilibrium money supply versus optimal policy money supply uh, for just one currency, right? So there is there is a there is a difference here, but I'm, for the for the sake of time, I'm going to skip it, and I'm going to explain uh, what happens with the with local currency versus the dollar. Uh, so do you have a guess of what's going to happen? What's, how does, how the optimal policy differs from equilibrium when there are two currencies? Yeah. What are the again? You can do capital controls and you can uh, uh, back the local currency. So you can do capital controls you can hold dollar reserves, so you can hold dollars on, on behalf of the local citizens, and and these dollar reserves can can back the local currency, and taxes can back the local currency. So you have full control over how many dollars and how and and how much local currency is in a small country. But you don't do anything. You don't have any expenditure. Or right. So so it um, yeah. so the government does so yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, right? Um, so, huh? So you maximize. So you mac the policy objective is, is here formally defined. It's the expected utility of a uh, of every individual, which is which is the same, because they they behave identically. Yeah. So, so it turns out that, uh, and you know, we were surprised. You know, when you got it, this is what the model is telling us. We were a little bit surprised, uh, but the model says that okay, what's optimal to do is to um, so here there is no aggregate risk. There is just idiosyncratic risk. So, so it turns out that um, it, it's basically optimal to spend all of the dollars abroad and to replace them with local currency uh, and uh, you know, to optimize the, the level of local currency. So the policymaker without aggregate risk would not use dollars at all. Okay. Uh, except, you know, so, 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 you know, there are some extreme cases of the, if you take crazy parameters and the, the local economy is uh, shrinking at a huge rate, then yeah, then you would uh, you would hold the dollars, but you know, but for reasonable parameter values, you wouldn't. So the reason why is so suppose that um, the locals are using dollars, and suppose that what you do is you um, just the policymaker replaces the dollars with the local currency and just starts spending the dollars. So then there is a big benefit because you can spend the dollars. Um, and when you switch from one currency to another, the uh, effect on insurance of idiosyncratic risk is the same. Well, so so actually you can you can improve the you can improve the insurance of idiosyncratic risk because you can you can optimize it because you can optimize the quantity of money uh, in circulation by you know by backing money by taxes or you know creating some inflation. Uh, but let's let's say you don't do that. You you give the same amount of local currency. So then it, there is another effect which happens, which is that the dollar was uh, um, earning some return, okay? And then the local currency is earning the return equal to the growth rate. Uh, and if it happens that the growth rate is, um, 
uh, less than the return on the dollar, then you're giving up some benefit of using the, the dollars by, by switching. Uh, and, but Right. So, so the, the, the government can tax uh, capital and, and back the, the pesos by taxes, and that way it can select equilibrium. Right. So you can select, you have to select the equilibrium by that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, right. so interesting comment about uh, equilibrium selection in these models. Um, so uh, there's... In a Bewley type of economy, there is an equilibrium where money has value. There is an equilibrium where money is worthless. There are equilibria in, in between. If you, do, uh, um, if you back money by uh, epsilon of taxes, then that automatically selects the unique equilibrium with the, with the maximum value of, uh, of money. Yeah, and, and, and this logic can be taken to an extreme, actually. This logic can be taken to an extreme. So it could be that money is backed by taxes a million years from now, by epsilon of taxes. That selects the equilibrium with money. And uh, if money is backed by epsilon of taxes a million years from now, and until then, the government is running deficits and, uh, and creating inflation, uh, you know, as, uh, as long as, you know, that's, that's not too big, that depends on the, you know, the level of the frictions. So then still, that selects the equilibrium where money has, has value. But, 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 but it turns out in the, in that in that case, there is room for another currency like Bitcoin. So, so, so anyways, um, so since, since I'm running out of time, let me just say a couple of words about uh, some of the thing, other things that we do. So, so that was without aggregate shocks. With aggregate shocks, we have a result that uh, equilibrium is efficient. Sorry, with, with aggregate shocks and no idiosyncratic shocks. Because with aggregate shocks and no idiosyncratic shocks, uh, everybody is, is identical, and so individual maximization is going to be, with respect to how many dollars to hold, is going to be the same as uh, a policymaker maximization. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, with, uh, with just countrywide shocks, this is the same type of a model that they do in corporate finance when they talk about, uh, uh, like, cash management, how much cash the, the firm should hold, and it's like you hold a certain amount of cash. If, huh? The Bolton, the Bolton paper, exactly. So, so if you if you run out of cash at some point, then you you sell assets to, or you raise equity, um, uh, and how much how much you're going to borrow. So there are the interesting things that happen is like there is the net, there is the borrowing limit. You can borrow up until Q lower bar, okay. But you don't borrow up until Q lower bar. At some point, you're gonna before getting there, you're gonna start adjusting because if you get wait all the way to Q lower bar, then the firm is dead. Okay, so you adjust before that's that's the maximum amount that you would borrow, but you, but uh, you t and you try to hold some buffer of of uh, dollars above that level, uh, and how big is that buffer depends on the level of uh, aggregate risk. Okay, uh, and uh, how much uh, buffer you hold depends on the uh, rate of return on cash. Okay, that's that's kind of obvious. But in this international setting, it implies that you you can have spillovers from uh, like the U.S. monetary policy to the emerging economy. Okay, and uh, uh, and if the interest rate on the dollar goes up, then uh, the growth rate in the in the small economy goes down at least temporarily because they're, they're trying to accumulate dollars. So we also solve this model with uh, with two currencies. Okay. 
and uh, sorry, with, with two currencies and with two shocks. Okay. Uh, and in equilibrium, we get basically a more nuanced version of the uh, non monotonicity non result that uh, if you do the comparative static on idiosyncratic risk, then uh, uh, with idiosyncratic risk, the local currency is worthless if idiosyncratic risk is too low uh, and uh, the value goes up uh, and then eventually the local currency disappears. But, the, but there's an exchange rate with, which is changing with, with respect to the foreign, net foreign asset uh, position. Okay? And then uh, uh, you know, we explore spillovers and we, we then do a policy. Okay? Um, and, uh, and it turns out that um, the locals hold many more dollars in equilibrium than uh, the policymaker would like to hold. Uh, and the question is, what's the optimal uh, amount of dollars that uh, the policymaker would hold? Uh, and uh, the quick answer is, so this is, this is a numerical, uh, you know, uh, ex uh, numerical calculation. So, but um, these are the dollar holdings in equilibrium as a function of the level of idiosyncratic risk. So the bigger the idiosyncratic risk, the more dollars people hold. Um, and uh, this is idiosyncratic risk equal to zero, so this is only the aggregate risk there. Okay. Uh, and this is under the optimal policy, the optimal dollar holdings. So, so the policymaker would hold the amount of dollars, basically, which would correspond to um, having no idiosyncratic risk. And if idiosyncratic risk goes up, then the policymaker would hold the same amount of dollars, just would supply the, the local currency. So it's not exactly, but you know, basically. So um, and and how to do how to do optimal policy here? So how to do optimal policy is that what we can actually do is we can derive the uh, equilibrium equations, okay? And then some of the equations are determined in equilibrium. And instead, the, the policymaker can basically uh, impose controls and we eliminate them, and then it becomes uh, uh, an HDB uh, equation uh, for the policymaker in that way. You know. So, so I if you are able. It kind of takes away the equilibrium effect, in a sense, by the reaction that they get to Yeah, mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. And here with this policy space, the state space uh, in equilibrium and with the policy is the same, okay? But if we tie the policy maker's hands, then, uh, then it turns out that the policy makers, so with, for example, you can do taxes, but you cannot do capital controls. So then the policy maker's problem will actually have uh, uh, another state variable because the policy maker will have to take uh, promised expectations into it. Huh? Exactly, exactly. So, so there's going to be another promised uh, state variable. So I should finish, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.